This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the June 7th edition of the DRF Players Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back after a week-long absence with the usual crew at DRF Formulator Mike Hogan and at UT Big Hair, Jonathan Kinchin. How are you doing today, Mike? Doing well. You know, back in the saddle. Uh, only a little worse for the wear, but uh, I'm ready to go and I'm excited to do another, uh, another podcast. I kind of missed it. Jonathan, I want to talk to you about your week in the wilderness, Mike, but Jonathan, first, let's just check in with you. Everything good down there in Texas? Everything's great down here in Texas, America. Uh, got out of the house a little bit early. I'm sitting out here at this uh, coffee shop called Mozart that, like, looks out over uh, the lake we have here in town, so uh, the view is nice. The view is nice for sure. Sounds lovely. Speaking of nice views, Mike, how, how does the, the view from your place in Forest Hills, Queens, compare to your old Manhattan digs? Oh, boy. Um, it's like night and day. You know, I mean, uh, the the 18th floor of the building, uh, you know, where we lived, uh, which is where our apartment was in Manhattan, uh, looked out basically into New York Presbyterian Hospital. So every time my wife looked out the window, she looked at her work. Uh, now we look out the window and um, we see trees, we see uh, grass, we see uh, and, you know, nice little houses. We see people walking dogs. Uh, you know, and my my son looked out the window and said, "Mommy, do you work there now?" Because <laughs> he's used to her working across the street. <laughs> I love it. I, I I I like the way that that uh, I like the way that the young mind works. It makes perfect sense to me. I have to ask, how bad is the commute though? Uh, you, you know, get it's to walk to work. It's not terribly bad. I used to walk to work. took about a half hour to do so. If I took the train, I maybe shaved five to ten minutes off because I had to walk far enough to the train station and then wait for the train. So I didn't really save much, which is partly why I walked. Now, um, you know, it's about... I got to drop my son off at daycare first, so just accepting that, lopping that off the equation, it's probably about a 45 minute um, from from door to door to door commute. It's not not hard. Bad. And are, no. are you dealing with like a, a packed seven train, or is it a little more civilized than that? It's the E train. Um, it's not so packed. It's not as bad as uh, taking, the, say, the six train, which is what I had to take if I decided I wanted to at the old place, which is partly why I didn't, because that's that's like it's, you you can barely stand in there. <laughs> yeah, that, that east side line's a bit of a bit of a hassle. Jonathan, the last time I saw you was at Monmouth Park. Uh, I didn't really ever talk to you about how your contest went. I did not see your name on the leaderboard, so I assume it wasn't uh, a situation where you were covering yourself in glory. But what uh, what was the tale of your Monmouth contest? It was uneventful. <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> you just grinded yourself into submission, or did you have one big... Yeah. Amp that, that blew up. Give give me some specifics here. You know, I think Highland Sky would have helped uh, quite a bit, uh, and the Pennine Ridge. Uh, that was kind of the that was the the opportunity to kind of turn it in a better direction, and and uh, so be it. Yeah, that, we'll get we'll talk about that race. Actually, I thought that horse ran very very well uh, once again. Overall winner of the contest was Mark Strife, former NHC Tour winner. But uh, the stories I'm going to be highlighting this week are the two folks who got two entries up into the prize pool. One was George Shute from Massachusetts. George is one of those players who's been on my list to interview forever, and I finally got the excuse. I've seen his name on leaderboards the last couple of years since I started working for DRF. He's cool. He, he's a player. He plays an awful lot. He's in his 60s. He's retired, two-tour Vietnam vet, and has a, a really interesting approach to the game in general and to contests specifically. I'm going to actually, when we get off the, the show here today, work on putting the finishing touches on my piece about him. should be up on DRF.com later today. Then also later today, I'm going to be talking to Brent Sumja. The other story I want to highlight, both Brent and George ended up with two entries in the prize pool and all kinds of fantastic prizes involving uh, Breeders' Cup betting challenge seats, NHC seats, and cash. For the full breakdown, I've got my uh, my article up there. And we have to get Brent back on the show because I was talking to him about the little bet that we made a few months ago. 
And he had a very interesting interpretation of it where, where he thought that uh, Jonathan, by virtue of finishing last in our little bet, needs to buy dinner for all of us. So what do you think about that, J.K.? Uh, of course he does. Of course he does. I'm going to tell him that since he won so much money this weekend, it's back on him. <laughs> <laughs> he did do very well. Uh, Brett, a fine player, tour champion, another past tour champion himself. That place was filthy with NHC tour champions and even NHC finals champs. That was the thing that struck me the most was it was almost like a mini NHC looking around the room, and you have all these great contest players coming in from every corner of the globe contest action coming up this week. We've got continuing feeders on tournaments.drf.com. Check that out. And uh, this weekend, there's an interesting opportunity for Midwestern players out at Prairie Meadows. We're working to have our friend and friend of the podcast, Bob Nastanovich, on for Friday's show, talk a little bit more about the Prairie Meadows contest this weekend, and also help us handicap. I'm guessing it'll be the Belmont day pick four that we'll do on Friday's show. Bob told me he's supposed to be clocking at the time of the show, but I, I asked if he could get a substitute clocker and join us. He's going to work on that. Should that not work out, we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll try to find somebody else. to We'll press somebody into service to come on and talk to us on Friday. But uh, today we're not doing any actual handicapping. We're going to be just sort of speaking more generally after our week off and talking about some of the events of the weekend. We'll start with a question for you, Mike. Was there any particular, uh, what, what it, for you, what was the headline coming out of last weekend's racing? Uh, let's see. The headline coming out of last weekend's racing, personally for me, was um, chaos in the living room, boxes everywhere, no TV, <laughs> no Internet. <laughs> um, so I didn't caught up, see, though? Have you, I, have yeah, you? I didn't get to see anything live, but I did, I did catch up, and I was a little bit active on Twitter. Um, you know, of course, I think the big story was... Um, uh, it's kind of a non-story, uh, <laughs> really, or at least not news, which is Beholder's pretty good. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about that. Impressive once again. And, uh, you know, you sent out a tweet about this, Mike, I saw where it seems like you at least are ready to enter her uh, in the conversation with those other great race mares we've seen and talked about so much on the show from the last decade Rachel Alexandra and Zenyatta. Jonathan, do you think that is a premature move by Mike, or do, you, or do you think it's time we should start having that conversation? No, I don't think it's premature at all. I mean, obviously, I, I think the, the the icing on the cake and, and kind of the nail in the coffin will be um, one more big win against the boys this year, whether it be the Pacific Classic again against California Chrome, which would be a really cool matchup, or whether it's going to be the Breeders' Cup Classic. Um, at her home track. So I think one of those two would, would, would definitely cement her, but I would, wouldn't argue with anyone that wanted to throw her into the conversation right now. And, Mike, you put out a Twitter poll on that question. What did the res Is it finished, and what did the it results is. look like? It's finished, and it's actually um, I, part of the reason why I put the poll out, uh, and, and I did it the evening or I, maybe even the day after her win, Boy, it's, it's all, last week is all a blur to me. I, I can't remember even when I did it. Um, but I, I put it out partly because everyone was so, you know, still basking in the glory of her victory and talking about how great she was. And I wanted to just get a general pulse of not necessarily uh, the Hall of Fame voters or, you know, anybody talking about, oh, how does she fit in the Pantheon. I just wanted to get a sense of, of this excitement for her win um, is this enough to push her into that conversation, uh, or, or or is it still a little bit tempered by you know hey the the the, the big mares are still the big mares, and uh, I was surprised. Rachel got less than a quarter of the vote, about 15, 16 percent for Beholder, and a runaway victory for Zenyatta, 62 uh, percent, nearly 800 votes. So it was a pretty decent sample size interesting. I wonder what that tells us. Um, I think it tells us, well, one thing that leaps to mind is, fair or unfair, people seem to be looking, um, I'm guessing that means they're looking pretty closely at Rachel's four-year-old year and maybe not thinking as much about that three-year-old year, which for me is 
got to clearly be the greatest individual season that any of those three have had. Uh, what does that tell you, Jonathan? That you know you're the you're the man to ask about this, given the given the ink on your arms representing both of those those great ones. I'm I'm kind of impressed that you weren't uh, you know even offended by the idea of mentioning Beholder in the same breath with those two. But w when you hear those results, do they do they surprise you at all? Yeah, no, I, I think that, that uh, the Rachel and Zenyatta thing, I, the reason I would think that maybe Zenyatta gets more credit is I think the casual fan can relate to her career and the success of her career just because it's very simple. She raced 19 times in a row, and she won all 19, and she lost her 20th by a desperate nose to uh, in, a, in a big race against the boys for $5 million. And I think Rachel's season was a little bit more, um, was a little bit more catered towards the racing fan and the, the in-depth fan who understands the importance of, of winning the Preakness, winning the Haskell, beating the older boys, uh, the older males in the, in the Woodward, and, or the, I'm sorry, the Whitney, Whitney or Wood, Woodward, whichever one, the Woodward. Or the Woodward. And yep. so I think that, I think that the, the way that her season happened was just it caters a little bit more to the in-depth fan rather than the casual fan. Zenyatta could have captured both of those. That's a great point. Um, do we think that's true in general, Mike? I, I'll admit a lot of times with Twitter I'm just – reading my notifications unless there's some pressing reason to go on there you seem to have your finger on the pulse a lot more I joke about horse racing Twitter a lot but who makes up horse racing Twitter is it more of a fan audience of racing do we think than a serious horse player audience how would you characterize it uh, you know it's you get everything really I mean it's it's a pretty wide swath you get you get the, the fans you get the serious horse players you get the people pretending to be animals um, <laughs> I've seen a few of those yeah, you know it's uh, it's you name it you get it um, but I think in general yeah I mean you know obviously the wider audience probably doesn't tend towards putting thousands of dollars a week through the windows um, you know but it, uh, by and large it seems like a lot of them even if they're more fans you get people that are are knowledgeable about racing history to, to an extent at least the ones that want to engage in those kinds of deeper discussions are familiar with have watched the uh, Preakness from Rachel and the Haskell and um, you know Zenyatta's classics and you know are aware of what the Beholder uh, is doing out west and how it maybe is is starting to fit in with some of those older ones and I think part of the reason why you need to start looking at Beholder in the in that light is not just the accomplishment and not just you know she won against males last year she's probably going to try again in this the classic this year but the longevity and the consistency and the body of work throughout her career as a two-year-old and now as, what, a six-year-old um, is in some ways uh, can't even be topped by what you saw with Rachel or Zenyatta. Zenyatta didn't run as a two-year-old and certainly wasn't, wasn't winning stakes races as a two-year-old. Uh, and, and, you know, none of them have had as long a career spanning as many years and, you know, Beholder hasn't lost a step, and she's uh, seemingly been a champion and is likely going to be a champion yet again this year. So um, that's partly why I think she has to be added into the conversation. What do we know in terms of the specifics of the next race plans for Beholder? Uh, Jonathan, have you heard anything? Um, I don't. I'm not in the loop. I would imagine that it's going to be the Pacific, Pacific Classic is too far away, so she's got to have one more start in between then and now. Um, but I'm not, I really, I'm not sure exactly. I haven't heard. Well, let me, um, let me pull it up. Uh, of course, our, our buddy Steve Anderson has written an article on DRF.com about Beholder. Um, and, and I, I noted in, in the week that was recap that she, sure she's won eight stakes in a row. Um, she's won 14 races in Southern California in a row. Um, and I think all of those were stakes races as well. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible. Um, so his article says um, the Pacific Classic is part of the uh, the goal, you know, the intermediate goal. Um, and it, I don't think there's any immediate next steps. Uh, I think the long term goal remains the the, um, the the Breeders' Cup Classic, and uh, at some point they'll, they'll whether they'll get a race. In, into her before the Pacific Classic remains to be seen, but um, I think that's going to be the, 
the next stepping stone next time she'll face males. A few other races I did want to touch on from the weekend. Another one involves a filly beating boys. Our old pal Catch a Glimpse looked okay in the Penn Mile. Did you get a chance to see that race, Jonathan, since, uh, since the weekend? I did see it. Yeah, no. Uh, um, what did you think? It was, pretty Im- it was pretty impressive. I actually, I, uh, I texted uh, Norm the morning after, and I said, Teppin 2.0. So uh, <laughs> that was going to be my question. Is that what we're looking at here? Uh, it's a little premature uh, to, to make that comparison, but she, I mean, she's pretty impressive. Um, there's been, I can recall, I didn't play that race, but the two races prior to that, I tried to beat her. And, and uh, when I feel like I can make a handicapping case to beat a horse two consecutive times and they kick me right in the face, it's, uh, it's time to get over that and to accept that uh, they're pretty darn good. And, and I think that she is pretty special, obviously with, uh, their, her ability to beat the boys. Aero Force is a quality three-year-old turf uh, turf horse, and so um, I think moving forward she's going to be dangerous. And, and she's one of those turf horses that that I have no problem supporting because their tactical speed. Um, she'll find herself in races in, in Saratoga this summer where they're going 50 to the half, and she's going to win for fun. So uh, I think she's going to have a really big year. Did Norm tip his hand at all? Assistant trainer Norm Cassie, we're talking about friend of the podcast as to what might be the, the next plan for her, or did, was that discussed? Uh, did his dad discuss that in interviews, or what, 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 do, we, what do we know? You mentioned Saratoga. What, what do you think of that, that three-year-old series of races they have up there? Is that what they're talking about? Uh, I would imagine that's the, that's the situation. Norm, Norm's response to me was the, uh, was the, was the fist bump emoji. So <laughs> he, didn't, he, he, didn't, he didn't say, uh, he didn't, we didn't get into details about it, but uh, I mean, I guess if, if, if that was my horse, the, the situation I would look at is uh, I would just try to target all of the big uh, mile races for, for, for three-year-olds, and, and I, wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be scared to, to get away from, from the, the girls and, and run against the boys. Obviously, she's proven that she can do that in a $500,000 race, and, um, you know, they, they, they had a string at Saratoga last summer, and it seems like that would be the place to go this year. Uh, Jonathan mentioning emojis. I, I just want to point out how fluent he is. I thought he, in in a little Twitter fight he had a couple of weeks ago, it was some of the best use I've ever seen of the poop emoji. I wanted to give you props for that on the show, Jonathan. Good work. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, Mike, do we know what figure Catch a Glimpse got in the Penn Mile, or did you have any uh, any any thoughts on that race? Uh, I can look up the figure. Um, I don't believe it was anything. Um, I think it was in the somewhere in the 90s. I'll check that. But what I did want to talk about, and I wanted to get your take on it. Um, I saw both uh, on Twitter and, and on DRF.com uh, our colleague Mike Watchmaker talking a little bit about the trip that Catch a Glimpse got, and talking a little bit about um, just being able to get away with somewhat you know easy early fractions, and um, you know just just run on in the in stretch and and never really looked like at any point she was um, uh, really facing much pressure from any of her her rivals. Do you tend to agree? And if so, would you downgrade an effort like that, uh, which was what watchmakers seemed to be implying, or at least that's what I took out of it. What was your take on any of that? Well, I mean, clearly, when horses are left alone to do running by themselves on the front end, that, that, that's going to make them more dangerous than if they're in a more competitive situation in terms of the race to the pace call. For me, I wouldn't go crazy downgrading her only because she's shown, for example, in that race that we saw together the weekend of the Keeneland contest, Jonathan, that she can also sort of sit and have that three wide off the speed trip and pounce. So for me, it, it's all about what, how many data points you have. And if the only data point I have is a horse loose on the lead, and, and maybe, then maybe I think, well, maybe that's why she was able to finish so well. But because with Catch a Glimpse, we have a little bit more of a body of work, I think it might just be a case where she's there. It's not just that she has this tactical advantage why she's doing so well. She's just faster than them, so that's the way that the race played out. That, that's how I look at it. Jonathan, does that sound about right to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of like it's kind of a. I mean, I look at it kind of simply like, if they're loose on the lead and then they extend in the stretch, then that 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 doesn't. I'll never downgrade a horse for that situation. I'll keep it in the back of my head that the horse obviously had an an easy lead, but she was extending. Like she, 
her when she if, from the eighth pole home, her lead was larger. I mean, Aero Force kind of ran at her a little bit late as she started to kind of shut down. Um, the the loose on the lead horses that I downgrade are the ones that are loose on the lead and they win by a body, or they win by a head, or they win by a nose, and they're just desperate to hold on. Uh, she was extending, so I, it wouldn't be a downgrade for me. It'd just be something that I would keep in the back of my head moving forward. So she got a 92, 92 buyer, which um, is her career top, in fact. Uh, she had a 91 last start in the Edgewood um, against Phillies. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and I kind of agree. I mean, I think a lot, I won't necessarily downgrade perfect trip horses, especially if they've shown me that they can rate a little bit and aren't a need-to-lead type. A lot of times, good horses make their own trips. Um, so I don't see that as a negative. If you if you keep trying to knock a horse who keeps getting a perfect trip um, and you want to play one that, that seems to keep finding trouble, you know, I've, I've too many times uh, been on the, the losing end of those those kinds of situations and you know just good horses make their own trips yeah I mean I think it's 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 not necessarily as cut and dried as that for me but there's no doubt for me that what's Mike saying has a lot of truth in it in terms of there are the sort of um, they, they, I just don't think they're that common but there are there's a small subset of horses at either end of the scale I think who either create their own trouble or have various attributes that allow them to make their own trips through being especially attentive to rider's instructions, etc. Uh, where Catch a Glimpse Falls might be, she's uh, got a terrific combination of attributes in that in races that she's going to run in, her sort of natural speed is going to allow her to be very, very competitive to the pace call. And yet, as Jonathan points out, she's also got that ability to finish. Turf racing is a little different. You don't, you don't see nearly, you, sure, you see plenty of wire-to-wire -wire winners, but at the highest levels, you don't see horses getting, in my opinion, on turf, carried by the track or just being there by the virtue of their early pace advantage. They've got to really be able to finish in a way that can be quantified for them to be a danger race in, race out. And because Catch a Glimpse has that ability, uh, it, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't downgrade for that. They, now it's interesting. They're talking a little bit, it seems, about the Belmont Oaks as a possibility. That segues nicely into the next race I wanted to talk about, which was the Wonder Again from Sunday. But before we go there, I will say that I, I would see the mile and a quarter distance of the Oaks, and I would see City Zip on the top, and I, and I would maybe get a, just a little bit nervous. What do you think, Jonathan? Uh, does the breeding on Catch a Glimpse bother you at all for the for the Belmont Oaks? No, uh, it, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't make me want to run to the window. Um, but you know, I, I think we've all said a few times, or at least you and I have, that I'm sure Mike has too, that the, that the New York racing, these turf races, you know, when you wake, when you see, and you look up and you see 50 and three to the half, you're not like mm. completely shocked. You're annoyed, but mm -hmm. you're not shocked. And I don't care if she's, I don't care if she's out of, if she's out of a quarter horse mare, you know, if, <laughs> you know, you know, you know what I mean? If, if she's going to go 50 to the half, it's quality as she is. Uh, they might not, they might not be able to get to her. So uh, it just depends on the scenario. It depends on if there's going to be other horses that are going to be involved in that, in that spot. Um, that could pressure her up front. Yeah, I mean, it definitely takes some of the stamina out of play when you're allowed to go when you're allowed to go that easy gallop early. So the other race I was talking about was won by Time and Motion for Jimmy Toner, who I think will now be looking like uh, one of the other choices in that race, the Belmont Oaks. I thought it was a cool story with uh, Toner not only training uh, basically the whole family, uh, the, all those Phillips horses in the, in the pedigree of time and motion, but also, of course, training Wonder Again herself. Uh, Jonathan, did you get a chance to watch the, the Wonder Again, and did you have anything, uh, any, any particular thoughts about it? Um, I, I watched it back. I didn't get to really handicap it and watch the race initially. I was, I was traveling. I just, I had following, I've been following time of, in motion. I had bet her last two times. In fact, I think on that March 20th, that comeback race, um, I bet her in the, uh, I think that was the, I think that was the San Anita tournament. Um, the San Anita Preakness challenge that they had. I, yes. <laughs> she's three to five. That's right. Yep. I bet. Uh, Sounds like something you I, would bet. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I uh, better get off, get off to a good start. Which, so. which, uh, which uh, I'm going to jump in and, and say, hey, I noticed the other night at Mountaineer, I think it was Sunday, uh, not, uh, morning line favorites were nine for nine. So, Jonathan, i got to imagine you cashed in big, right? <laughs> Yeah, if only I looked at if only I looked at Mountain here a little bit more. But her but as for the performance in in the Wonder again, were you impressed and is this one you expect to go forward? Yeah, no, I you know, I, I think that she's definitely gonna move forward. She obviously has the pedigree to do so. Um and and you know, she's three for three on the year and, and, and obviously moving in the right direction. Uh, it, it's an interesting group. Um, you know, it feels like in the last few years, maybe with Lady Eli, that's the reason. It felt like this is a really powerful, strong group, and and uh, it feels like the top is a little bit heavy here. But you know, it, it's, she's definitely one to look at moving forward. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting race. Harmonize had to maybe do a little bit more dirty work, maybe moving a little earlier than she'd ideally want to. I'm not convinced she isn't a little better than that. And I thought, you know, I. I uh, I don't love questioning jockey rides, but I, but I will say that I expected Gray Stark to run a little better and was a little bit surprised by a, a rider who I, I normally uh, really like on the turf, and I think his best rides sort of look like, we talked about Teppen 2.0, I think when Irad Ortiz is at his best on the turf, he looks like Ramon Dominguez 2.0. I, I didn't think so on Gray Stark. I, I thought it was strange that he sort of fought with her early to put her in a position where he was then sort of forced to lose ground around the turn, I think definitely cost, I think the, the trip definitely cost her a placing, ended up traveling something like 45 feet farther than the winner. Don't think she was necessarily going to beat the winner, but thought she could have been in the conversation for second and certainly could have got the trip that the third place finisher last waltz got. Just one that I might take another look at. Was very disappointed with Elysia's world. I don't know what happened there. Uh, but it, one that, it, for me, that falls into the category of, like, race that's too bad to be believed. I don't imagine they'll persist to the Belmont Oaks, but maybe she's one to keep an eye on where she where she turns up later. Mike, did you have any thoughts on the Wonder again? Uh, yeah, I did get to watch it. Um, you know, I thought that the, the two best were uh, were the top two, although I, I did think, you know, last waltz uh, running on um, looked pretty good. Those, those are the ones I'd want to take out of it from there. I don't know... Um, uh, which would be a play, or which which one I would want to lean on uh, if I was going to try and beat, uh, catch a glimpse if she indeed does go there. But um, it, it should make for an interesting race if if all those move forward and, and show up. Uh, what's that? The day before uh, uh, Independence Day is that usually when they run it? I think it's July third, the Oaks, and July fourth, the Derby. Uh, if yeah, that sounds, sounds right. right. It's, it's it's definitely that. Uh, it's around that time. We'll, we'll take a look. We'll be covering those races in depth on the podcast when we get closer. Speaking of the Derby, we talked for a second before about the Penine Ridge. Uh, Jonathan, who is best in the Penine Ridge? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not Luis Saez. Um, yeah, I mean, that Highland Sky was best. That, I mean, he ran so big. I have no idea why it was necessary to go eight wide. And he still almost got up. Two more jumps, I think he would have gotten there. Uh, obviously, it's sour grapes. I'm a little bit bummed out for personal reasons. But, uh, no, I think Highland Sky was best. I think that he's uh, definitely the whole – I think he'll be favored moving forward um, in the Belmont Oaks. And so – I mean, I'm sorry, the Derby. And so, yeah, that's, that's, where, uh, that's where my opinion lays. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, I, I thought the horse was clearly best and uh, was also a difficult betting result for me, sitting there in the nice uh, parterre boxes at Monmouth, courtesy of our, our friend Brian Skirka, who did a great job putting on that Monmouth contest. And uh, I just, you just, it was one of those things that coming for home, I just didn't, I didn't expect to win because of the trip we were getting. But boy, when you look at it after the fact, um, I, I'll, I, I'll pull up on track as what the what the numbers were, but you, but you got to figure we traveled a couple of feet farther than the uh, than, than the winner there, didn't we? Yeah, no, he he feels like Davisi Darrow last year to me. Like he just continuously keeps getting these unfavorable setups, slow paces to close into wide trips. Um, you know, is the the race out at Gulfstream was was slow and he was wide. The race at Aqueduct it was slow and he was wide. He overcame it. So, you know, you're not going to get much value. I think the world is seeing all of these trips and all these scenarios. Uh, but at the same time, I think that you'll get more value than you should if you were to won all, won, have won all three of those races. 
Who notes, Highland Sky 40 feet farther than Camelot Kitten, and yet only finished, uh, I mean, boy, like uh, just looking at the clock, is it uh, 0.06 seconds <laughs> uh, behind? And then another interesting note that has to do with the, just sort of the, the, how quickly he came home. He actually came home in 22.48 as opposed to Camelot Kitten's 22.65. So came home the fastest of any of the horses in the race as well. I, I think with a different kind of ride, uh, th this horse, is, so he's, he's sitting live uh, on, on a million-dollar race win in the Belmont Derby as far as I'm concerned. It's going to be hard for me not to bet him. Let's talk about Camelot Kitten for a second because um, I was a little surprised that, that he was bet as quite as enthusiastically as he was. He wins again. This is a horse now coming off a few a few perfect trips. I hesitate to say, oh, he's just gotten lucky. I mean, I do think he's gotten a little. He certainly got lucky that day to beat Highland Sky, but still ran pretty well. Jonathan, you're a big fan of this family. How good do you think Camelot Kitten is? Putting aside Highland Sky and the money we didn't win and all that, uh, let me hear your thoughts just on Camelot Kitten as a horse. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, he's a horse that I've always followed because he was a half to Bobby's Kitten. He's one of my favorite horses of all time. And uh, I'm sorry, he's a full, a full to Bobby's Kitten. Oh, he's a full. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, full. I'm just so used to saying half because fulls aren't that uh, aren't that common. Um, you have to respect the fact that since Chad and then added the blinkers, he's been, you know, he's two for two. They added the blinkers at, at uh, Derby Day at Churchill. He won that race with a great trip. And now he's come back and, and, and beaten, in my opinion, what's probably the best three-year-old turf horse in Highland Sky, regardless of the setup of the trip. You have to respect him a little bit. And you obviously have to respect Chad uh, moving forward with these types of horses, with these uh, turf horses going a little bit longer. And I don't think Camelot Kitten's going to have any problem getting a mile and a quarter. That's a good yeah. point. Uh, I, Jonathan, I was just going to tease you. you. You let this horse, who you've talked up on the podcast a, a couple times now, you let this horse beat you two times in a row. Escaped me twice in a row, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 I'm okay with the last one because he was so short. Yeah, but, uh, sure. but two back, it was, it, was, it was a little bit painful when he crossed you the line. Him on, you tipped him on the podcast before the race that day. Yeah. Granted, you said, oh, you called it a sentimental pick and, and implied that you might not uh, stick with that when, the, when, when it came time to go up to the windows. But I will give advice, and I know this from personal experience. If you tip a horse on the podcast, you better bet that horse because you're just, you know, not only is it kind of weird not to bet the horses you tip on the podcast, but you're just going to feel, you know, really lousy if they should happen to come in. It's, uh, it's insanity insurance. That's really what it is. You know, I mean, it's one thing to tip a, a horse and they go off at 8 to 5 and you don't need to bet them, whatever. If they go off double-digit odds, it's, it's completely insanity insurance just to put a, at least a few bucks on them. Now, this is the second instance this show where this has come up. Maybe it's a, a Jonathan Kinchin moderation on an old saying uh, the, the Jonathan's version would be twice bitten, thrice shy. I'm guessing. You know, you, you let these horses beat you twice, then the third time you 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 decide to get smart and back yourself up a little bit. At least is that is that where you're sitting with Camelot Kitten in the Derby? Or are you going to stick to your guns with this one and 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 be against him again? Um, no, I mean he'll be one that you have to include and use in multi-race plays and things like that. You don't want to get beat by that a horse that's two for two for Chad Brown, that's a half to, or full to your favorite horse in the world. But, um, no, I, I mean, I think that, that him winning those last two races is, is, is even more reason to, to play against the horse if there's any reason to do so when the PPs are drawn. Just because, you know, he's, he's going to be over bet. You know, you can already imagine he's going to be over bet based on winning two stakes races in a row. And so uh, he's the type that I would try to look to beat still. I, I think that makes sense, but I think that being a little more defensive for perhaps than in the past. You know, that's what I kept thinking is like I couldn't have covered I couldn't have covered a one way exacta just to save my bacon a little bit if Highland Sky ran second to him. You know, that's the kind of insurance play that I think sometimes even if it's a favorite you consider over bad. What Mike said it best before, a little little insanity insurance for just a couple of percent of your play, if only to just get your money back. Not a terrible idea. All right, so we've been spending a lot of time talking about the next big thing that's going to be coming up at Belmont with the, the, the 4th of July Festival. Of course, we have bigger fish to fry this weekend. We're going to spend most of Friday's show talking about uh, this Belmont Festival this weekend, culminating, of course, with the Belmont Stakes itself. Biggest headline, I guess, of the week is the DeSormo news, which I thought was really curious 
Kent, you know, well-publicized battles over the years with uh, substance stuff, specifically alcohol. Um, going into treatment, um, Mike, I'll ask you, does the, does the timing on this seem a little odd to you? Uh, I guess, but, you know, I mean, really, there's never a good time for this sort of thing, is there? Um, good point. You know, uh, so, you know, I, I, I guess so, um, but, however, he's, he's still going to ride in the Belmont. Um, word is they're going to have somebody from the center fly and travel with him and, and keep him company and make sure he uh, follows his treatment and, um, you know, so, uh, I yeah, I mean, I'm not terribly surprised. Um, obviously, he wants to stay with the horse, stay with his brother's horse, and, uh, you know, he's excited about his opportunities. And, uh, you know, I mean, I know he's had some issues, so I, I applaud him for doing the right thing and, and hope it all works out well for him. I mean, this is a guy who we've all watched over the years give some of the best rides that we've seen and some of the craziest rides that we've seen. And... I don't know. Let me ask you, Jonathan, as somebody who watches Southern California day in and day out, uh, DeSormo with his mind 100% on business, how, how, how good of a rider? Where does he stand in that colony overnight? Let's just say he has, you know, he's able to, to get a little bit more focus to his work. I mean, you know, a lot of the trip notes I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll do two things will happen. I'll, I'll look down, I'll watch the race and not really be paying attention to who the jocks are. And I'll say, golly, that guy looks great on a horse. Who is that? And I'll look down, and it's Kent. Right. And then, and it's it, he looks, in my opinion, he looks the best on a horse. He looks the most fluid on a horse. His hands is just, you know, just everything about how he rides a horse to me is is one of the best I've ever seen. Um, but then there's the times, which we've talked about a million times, where I look down, like, what in the heck is is he, is he even trying? And then I look, and it's Kent. And so, um, you know, I, and, and the thing about that is that I think that Kent has been doing this for so long. He's a Hall of Fame rider. Um, he, his personality is such that he, I uh, can't think of the, the right word. Essentially, what I'm saying is that I think that he, a lot of times, when he doesn't look like he's trying, it's because he's more of a horseman than we might give him credit for, and he's taking care of the horse, and he's not concerned about our trifecta bet. And that's a little bit frustrating as a better, um, but I'm sure that the horsemen really appreciate that, that he doesn't beat up their horses and knock them around. He takes care of them. So um, I think he's one of the, the most talented riders we have. Um, I know a lot of people, including myself, have you know, made jokes about some of the stuff that, he, you know, that he's been going through, and uh, it's more of not poking fun at him. I mean, i got people in my family that go through the same thing, so I'm not making fun by any means. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad he's going in the right direction. I'm glad that whatever happened must have been something fairly significant to kind of push him to this situation at this time. Um, obviously, he's, he's moving in the right direction. It seems like his family's supporting him, his owners are supporting him, his brother's supporting him, and so um, hopefully he'll get his, his situation sorted out and get going in the right direction. So, uh, you know, the best of luck for him. I want you to know, I, what you said. Oh, you go ahead, Mike. I was gonna, just going to say real quick, you know, I listened to the podcast that you guys did last week, week without me, and uh, the one, Jonathan, on Tuesday, you made a, a baseball. I was surprised that you made a, a baseball analogy. I'm going to use one here you may not get. It kind of reminded me of the timing of CC Sabathia's similar uh, rehab stint right before the playoffs. Uh, and, and I, and I, you know, you, you kind of wonder why is he making a choice to do it right now? It, like you said, Jonathan, something serious must have happened in order for him to say, okay, look, I need to get right, uh, and I'm going to do this now. So, because, you, you know, with CC, you could have done it with the, in the off season. With, with, with Kent, you could have done it less high profile time of year, but it, it must be something serious. And, you know, I, I just, uh, good for him. I just want to echo the idea of having people in my family in recovery. It, it is a, a, a brave and bold step, and it's this guy who's obviously struggled with this. And who knows? I mean, it, it's hard to know if any of the if, – what the connection exactly is between some of the, the odder things we've seen from Kent to over the years and, and, and this problem. But in any case, it's something not just for his racing career, but for the rest of his life. It would be fantastic if he could, uh, if he could deal with because – Obviously, a talented guy, and we, it'll be be an interesting little uh, sub story to Exaggerator's run on Saturday. What are we hearing about how uh, the big horse is doing out there at Belmont? Uh, we have several uh, of our top-notch DRF reporters on the ground. Mike, what's 
what's on the site right now that folks can read about Exaggerator? Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, I haven't checked uh, e anything today, but you know, every day we're getting. Uh, Mike Welsh put put in a note about his final work today. Uh, went five furlongs in uh, just under uh, 101. Um, you know, there's there's three or four uh, different stories coming up. Uh, seemingly every hour about the Belmont. So um, go and check it out. Uh, I'll be doing a piece later in the week about this you know, kind of similar stats piece that I did for the Derby and Preakness. I'll be doing one for the Belmont. Um, there's just a lot of content and there's more going up every day. I thought there was a good note from Marcus Hirsch saying, uh, based on what he's seen in the morning, this is not, not a horse you're yeah. going to want to be looking to bet against too strongly. Mar Mark yeah. is a worthy, always a worthy Twitter follow. Of course, uh, Dave Grenning out there as well. Lots of good news. If you scroll through the DRF feed, if you go to the DRF homepage and go down, you can see all the content that we have about the upcoming Belmont Stakes. We won't talk about the race specifically. We're going to be drawing. When are we going to be drawing? Tonight? Tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, I think right around noon. Uh, so Wednesday, okay. Wednesday around noon at, uh, I think, at Rockefeller Center. So, uh, you know, You're going to head over there? Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. They'll keep you. They'll keep you chained to the desk. You've got. Yes. Uh, you've got formulator facts, yes. right? That's right. But the uh, uh, how about the Friday card? Also very interesting. We got the, the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. All seem like they're going to be fairly loaded. They've been holding back a few racing days. I've noticed the last few weeks. I'm assuming we're going to have some really good, uh, really good stuff at least over the first three days of the weekend. What's what's available now, PP wise? Um, I believe Friday is up. Boy, you're putting me on the spot here, Pete. We didn't. Uh, uh, I just figure you can scroll and look the way that I'm doing right now. I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> well, you know. Uh, yeah. So uh, Friday is up. Um, uh, it's the early card on Friday. A lot of races. Eleven races. Bunch of stakes races. Some good racing there. And and the probables are up. I don't know if it's the full overnights, but the probables are up. Um, it's tweeted out by. Uh, Capital OTB. I just retweeted it. Um, the uh, for for Saturday, the the Manhattan just looks loaded. I don't know if you guys saw the field. Uh, oh no, I haven't looked. Oh, I haven't big looked. blue, big uh, in in alphabetical order. I'm not even going to mention the question questionables, but in alphabetical order, we got Big Blue Kitten, Divisadero, Flintshire, Grand Tito, Ironicus, Oathkeeper, Take the Stand, Triple Threat, Wake Forest, and World Approval. Uh, that should be a fantastic race. That's great. Well, we'll be talking about that, I'm almost sure. We'll be one of the four public handicapper races. We're going to be back on Friday to talk about that. I want to spend the rest of the show today. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about Mike and, and, uh, and Twitter on the show, sort of like the Mike Twitter edition of the DRF Players <laughs> Podcast, because that's what I want to ask about. You sent an interesting tweet the other day about the good old days, and I was curious what what exactly you meant and uh, and what prompted what prompted that it sounded like it might be something interesting for us to talk about uh, horse racing a sport there's a lot of nostalgia associated with it but there's also a lot of stuff going on in the present day I, I assume it had to do with the balance of the two but I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth Mike uh, tell tell us what you meant by it. tell us what that tweet was and uh, let's talk about what you meant by it what inspired it. Yeah, well, I, I just sent out, uh, I said, the good old days don't exist. These are the good old days. You know, because a lot of times I hear people talking, not just about, not just horse racing fans or horse players or, or, or even people in the industry, uh, you know, but, but wider, you know, it would be it in sports and politics and anything. Every, oh, you know, in the good old days they did this, or I missed the good old days, or you wouldn't have seen that in the good old days. Or, you hear this all the time. Um, and you know, uh, look, I'm not saying don't acknowledge and don't celebrate and don't um, you know uh, learn about the past. But uh, my my fear, and a lot of times the way I see it come across, is that people talk about how uh, things were so better, so much better in the good old days, and you didn't have all these issues that you have now. You didn't have. Uh, as much crime, you didn't have as much cheating in baseball or horse racing or whatever. You didn't have uh, players that would do these things or trainers that would do these things. You know, be careful, and I just mean be careful about this tendency to whitewash the past because 
there was a lot of stuff that went on in the past that maybe wasn't as good, and in doing so, you often miss some of the great things that are happening in the present. Um, you miss the fantastic resources, the fantastic achievements. You miss everything that's going on these days. You know, I mean, you think about the good old days. Uh, even Secretariat only only faced a few horses in the Belmont. You know, we've got full fields. You know, we've got American Pharaoh. We've got a, 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 a betting menu like has never existed in, in for horse players. Uh, you know, and in a lot of ways for horse players, the, the good old days are now. You, 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 there were times when you had to drive hours and hours in order to place a bet. Now you can bet on uh, horse racing around the world from your phone. You know, I mean, there's so many things that we have today that we didn't have in the quote-unquote good old days. And, um, you know, I, I, it was kind of more from that. You know, celebrate the positives of today uh, and don't whitewash the, uh, the sins of the past. What's the great line from Sopranos? Um, the lowest form of discourse starts with uh, remember when. And <laughs> I think there's something to be said for that. I mean, look, I like nostalgia as much as the next guy. And there are certain heroes of the past like, in, if I were making that speech or editing the speech you just made, Mike, which I largely agree with, like, I would have left Secretariat out of it, you know? Like, there's some things that, there's some things from the past that I'm completely comfortable lionizing and letting stand as sort of the, 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 the beacon, the gold standard, whatever you want to call it, of, of things that are great that we can aspire to in the modern day. But I do agree that, like, an over-reliance on that kind of thing or a knee-jerk reaction that, life or our society or our game even are on this sort of negative trope. I just don't think it's conducive to living life in a way that you're going to get the most enjoyment out of. And I certainly think, talking specifically about betting, that it's, a, it's, it's kind of a losing attitude. I think that we've seen again and again that if you're going to survive in a paramutual world, like you've got to be You've got to be more forward-thinking than that, and you've got to be looking to the new and embracing the new and changing. I think that, you know, I think we can all agree, if we're still in our handicapping doing what we're doing now 20 years from now, like exactly, we're going to be losing. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. the underpinnings, you know, maybe those stay the same, but you've also got to be a little bit more fluid. The other thing, when you were talking about uh, days of having to drive four hours to make a bet, if you're Jonathan Kinchin, I think that was 2014. Is that about right? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. exactly. Yeah, 100%. Um, Not fun. What, what do you think, Jonathan? I mean, you're somebody who, what I like about you is you're the, the newer generation of horse player, but you also just have a very clear, uh, it's not like in poker when a lot of the new guys came in, I think they were almost disdainful of the older guys and, you know, they had their computers and they'd gotten all this experience playing, uh, you know, millions of hands simulated and, and almost, I think, felt like they, they didn't need to worry about the way it used to be in the old days. You're somebody who I, I think of as being a, a new school handicapper, but who really appreciates the, the sort of classic way of doing things and, and the history of the game. I mean, how do you balance those two ideas and uh, what do you think about Mike's point of view on this issue in general? But no, I absolutely appreciate the history, and I, and I think you have to because if, if you don't appreciate the history, then you won't understand the significance of what's happening now, you know. For instance, one of the coolest things that happened to me in racing was, you know, the NHC a few years ago when, when I finished, you know, 7th and 11th or whatever, and, and um, that wouldn't be very cool if there hadn't been 15 other NHCs prior and no one had ever done it before, you know. And, and so it was the idea that people were congratulating me based on, the good old days or the history of, of what has happened in, in our sport. You know, the same for the Kentucky Derby. Like, the, the, the feeling I get when they play my old Kentucky home wouldn't be the same feeling if it wasn't for the Kentucky Derby that was, you know, raced uh, 142 years ago, or whatever it might be. So, you know, I, I think that it's important to understand that we are where we are because of the history. And even all the tools that we use now handicapping. I mean, those things were developed from old school theories and old school methods they've just been presented in a new school way and so to to have this like ah oh, it's all about the new school the old schools played out and irrelevant i you know i i just don't i just don't buy that so uh no i really respect it it's, it's what makes our sport great is the history that the sport has you know um 
you know, new stuff isn't really that exciting because there's not enough people and enough uh, experiences with new stuff that, that people can embrace it and enjoy it. So I'm fine with I'm the old school. It doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, there's definitely something to be said for uh, for tr for trying to take the boast the best of both of those perspectives. I'm going through what I might call a like a handicapping geek phase. I've been researching old handicapping books just for fun, just sitting around uh, sitting around after dinner, maybe during the the hour that uh, the parent watches TV in a day, and uh, busting out some ancient handicapping tomes. The one that I just I ordered online and have been reading over the last few days is William Quirin's Thoroughbred Handicapping State of the Art from 1984. And it's amazing to me, you know, you'll read some of these ideas, and obviously some of it's woefully dated because of changes in the way horses are trained. But then every now and then I come across a nugget that is, is saying something that's just as relevant today in a way that I think because of the difference in perspective of coming from decades in the past gets crystallized better than I've read anybody saying it in the last five or ten years. It's been a really cool exercise. I'll have to find an excuse to do a little bit of writing about it. And I think you could, to Jonathan's point, go back even farther. I would wager if you had the original Pittsburgh Phil Book of Maxims from about handicapping from 1904 or whatever it was. Yeah, you're going to find some that have nothing to do with anything. You know, don't bet a horse unless it's run in the last seven days or whatever. I don't know that that is one, <laughs> something like that, that you can just, you know, not worry about too much. But I'll bet you there's stuff in there that still could, uh, could strike a chord with players today. I think, you know, finding that balance of, of respecting the old and it, while at the same time not getting stuck in a trap where it's all you think about and you're constantly comparing yourself negatively uh, in the in the in the present daylight. Is that is that more the attitude you're you're striving for, Mike, and what you were hinting at in that in that tweet, or am I missing some aspect of it? Well, yeah, and it, it's more like look. Of course, we all need to know about and celebrate the past. And in you know, I mean, I'm a I'm a student of of history, and I love watching old races, and I love digging up old PPs and talking about you know is these old horses and things like that. I, for me, it's more just the the uh, uh, cautioning people against looking too much in the rearview mirror and 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 doing so at the expense of what's happening today or the excitement for what could be happening tomorrow. Um, because if you do that, you miss out on all of the greats. And, you know, we miss out on where, like we said earlier in the show, where Beholder fits uh, with some of the, the better ones we've seen recently. You know, uh, just think about all the fantastic horses we've seen in the last 10 years. It doesn't even matter to me where they fit, uh, you know, in, in terms of a Hall of Famers. It's just there's, there's some good, exciting races, good, exciting horses. There's a lot of things to be excited about now. It's, it, that's more my point. The, certainly learn about and celebrate the past, but, but don't miss out on what's happening now. I have another HBO analogy to throw in there. No, I'm not on the HBO payroll, although they'd be fine <laughs> sponsors for the podcast if any of my friends from over there are listening. But I promise this one will be spoiler-free. Um, Game of Thrones, this idea that if you, uh, you spend too much time in the past, you could possibly get stuck there. Just, uh, <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's another way of saying it. Gentlemen, uh, the time has come for final thoughts before we wrap up this June 7th. Not June fourteenth, but June seventh edition of the DRF Players Podcast. Anything further for today's show, Jonathan? No, I just think when you start doing your your pre Belmont work, I think that you need to consider this edition of uh, of Gettysburg. Uh, same ownership, same trainer. Uh, I think it changes the uh, changes the the pace scenario a little bit. Obviously, Elliot Walden said they're an easy area. They're not going to use him as a rabbit, but uh, I think the word rabbit is a little bit negative, and so I think that ownership tries to avoid it because it's suggesting that you're sacrificing another horse for, for, for another one. And so uh, it's going to change the, the, the scenario quite a bit for me. And so uh, when you're looking at that race, make sure you keep that into consideration. Very a smart. rose Mike, is a rose by any other – anyway. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, my, my final thought is actually a question for, for people listening. I don't know if you guys noticed on Friday night at Penn National there was a walkover, which... Um, yes. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I meant to mention that, actually. I was just sitting there. It was that same sort of deal, like uh, parents' TV hour was over. I'm looking up at the TV, and I'm seeing one... I had no idea what was happening. <laughs> one horse running around. I'm like, wait, where's the rest of the field? This looks like a workout, but there's odds on the side of the... And I had to, of course, turn to Twitter and figure out what was going on. Yep. So what, what was the story there? The story there, it was, a, it was a maiden race. It was a turf maiden race. It was off the turf. And I think many of the horses that were scheduled to race were out of towners that when they saw were coming off the turf, the trainers didn't even ship them in. So Tom Proctor had a filly who'd actually never raced on the turf before. She was a, a dirt maiden. Uh, entered into the race and uh, kept her in the race. She was the only one that stayed in. Uh, She's Lovely was the name of the filly. Uh, and she ran around the track in order to break her maiden against no other horses. So um, my, my question, you know, obviously we've got Spectacular Bid had a walk over. Uh, there was a, uh, I think it was, was it Sharp Cat in the Bayacoa, maybe in the 90s? Uh, we've seen some walkovers now and again, but they're usually in stakes races. I'm going to ask both of you and the audience, has there ever been a walkover in a maiden race before? I've not seen one. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't commit to that, but I'm just sort of saying from my uh, my experience, that's the first one I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. Jonathan, I presume the same for you? Yeah, no, no, I never, I've never seen one either. <laughs> I try to, I've, I've been wanting to watch it again, I, but I'm really confused. Did you take trip notes on that like... one? <laughs> one, 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 one. I did. I did. I... Did you see mine? No. You, you, did you tweet it? I did. I did. I said, yeah, but who'd she beat? Oh, that's, that's very point. cheeky. I like it. I like it. Um, literally then, no one. Literally, literally no one. Yes. But that's the thing. You know, she's going to show up now. She's going to be in against winners, but she still hasn't beaten a horse. So, you know, where does she fit? Bet against, man. Bet against. <laughs> of course, that's the knee-jerk reaction of everybody. She goes off at 17 to 1 and wins right, right. back. Right. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to. We'll keep an eye on that story. If anybody knows any more of the history, um, please do send it in. A, a little Easter egg comment. My final thought is a little Easter egg comment for our rock and roll fans listening. Uh, one of these days, we're going to have this up and running where we can play music um, in the pods. And this week's pod, it's just a real shame we can't go out with Carly Simon's anticipation. And if folks know the lyrics of that song, they'll know why. Maybe I'll even tweet it just to, to throw you a little bone. Plus, it's a good song. I love Carly. Anyway, that's it. Uh, thank you so much to Jonathan Kinchin. Thank you so much to Mike Hogan. Good to have you back. Show was not the same without you. But we did have uh, fun with my show with Jonathan and, uh, and the, also the Steve Davidowitz special. Surprised a lot. It was not surprised, but pleased with all the re good response we got on the Steve D show. If you missed that one, that's Evergreen. Go back and listen to that. We're angling to hopefully get him for a webinar later in the week. Pay attention to drf.com for that one. Thanks most of all to all of you for joining us. We'll be back on Friday with a detailed look at the Belmont Stakes and the Belmont Stakes undercard. Until then, may you win all your photos.